Just to follow on very quickly, of course, the irony of a museum deleting half of its history shouldn't be overlooked from that London Bridge thing. I think that's absolutely amazing. I didn't know that story. That's, that's terrific. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about restaurants. So I'm a cellist. Um, I normally speak at these sort of conferency things about technology and about using a lot of technology in my performance in music and how music and technology have always sort of straddled side by side. But today I thought it'd be more fun to talk about something a little bit more fundamental than um, plugging a cello into some boxes and toys and tricks. So a little bit about what I do. I, I say I'm a cellist and my work is all sort of focused on finding uh, a place for my classical cello skill set in 21st century world. Um, you know, the cello is an amazingly evolved piece of technology. It can, you can play in a 6,000, 10,000 seater hall and be heard crystal, beautifully crystal clear at the back. And yet nowadays we think, well, we can try and, you know, use it for new, new sounds and new tools, but it's 300 years old. It took 300 years to develop, but it's, it's pretty, pretty safe. Um, so I work with a lot of technologists on trying to uh, reiterate the cello, trying to find new ways for it to develop and and, uh, and find a new voice for the cello moving forward. Uh, so as I say, I speak at some conferences, normally about technology. Um, how many people here in the arts, in the arts sector? So a chunky, chunky number, good. So we've all been to countless conferences this year already. I think this is my seventh about, uh, we normally talk about you know, delineated digital strategies and, and finding new audiences, audience development, all these kind of bright, shiny topics. Um, coping in the age of austerity, um, finding new ways of doing stuff for less, for free, for cheap, and charging more money for it. Um, what, what we do with that new money, I have no idea, but anyway. Um, something that always strikes me is that we never actually think to look for a role model. So we, we talk about this in this amazingly theoretical way. It's like, well, we need a new audience and we have nothing to do with it. What do you go to, like the classical music industry isn't built to be popular. Like, what's going to happen if suddenly 20,000 people want to go to Bartok? Seriously, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> like, really, there is no infrastructure for this. No one's thought this one through. So, what we also lack is an identity, a real sense of personality. You know, we've got Dvorak, we've got Beethoven, Bach, Brahms, a whole lot, all still considerably dead. They're brilliant. <laughs> But they are still considerably dead. Um, but we're trying to put it in the present tense. I'm not, I'm not going to be slamming Bach. I love it. I mean, it's how I make half my living. So really, it's great. But, you know, he's still dead. And we can't really identify with him. Um, so my argument and my position is I play contemporary music. That's what I do. I play works by living composers. Because if I don't like it, I can argue with them and get it changed. And it's brilliant. Um, but the issue here is that we don't have anyone to look up to. We don't really have a model in mind. And I would like to suggest we should be looking at an industry which uh, doesn't have problems in the recession. It's self, you know, it's, it works on, on merit. Uh, you've got queues out the door. You charge what you like. You know, it's restaurants. It's the world of the celebrity chef, right? So, OK, maybe it's, mm, yeah. But, you know, they're entrepreneurs, they're authors, they're chefs, they're presenters, teachers, they're employers, they have an ecosystem. But more importantly, they share, everything they do is based around sharing, sharing what they do, their passion. And, you know, as, as I get to go travelling, I get to travel a lot for, for my sins, and you get to see airports, you get to see concert halls, you get to see restaurants. And everyone's critical of airports, that's just a natural right. Most people are too, too scared to criticise a concert hall. They're, everyone's welcome to, but most people try and kind of lay off that. And restaurants, you have a, a beautifully inbuilt culture. You know, you go, you love the food, you do this, but food is a fixed cost. The variable cost is the experience. It's the, it's the everything around it. So I don't have any slides, just have my name. Um, but I'm going to... I'm going to rather, rather arrogantly assume we've all been to at least one nice restaurant. And um, that is the privilege of the classical music industry. They have no money for anything else but nice meals. <laughs> so I'm going to talk you 
talk you through walking into a nice restaurant. It does happen to be a Michelin-starred one, but that's another story. Um, so, in your mind's eye, picture yourself walking into a really nice restaurant, okay? You walk through this big door, and it's beautiful, it's glass. You know, you're met by the receptionist, name's taken, you're led to the coat check, you put your coat in the thing, it's so fabulously busy, you're taken off to get a drink, you go and buy a drink, and then eventually you're led down this lovely corridor to your table, given a menu, you know, you're sitting there, and you start having a conversation about what's on the menu, what you'd like, what you're going to order, what you're going to eat. And, you know, the waiter comes back a couple of minutes later and starts asking what you'd like. And so I was in a group of four, right? And of this group, there were two people who were really quite food snobbish. They knew their stuff. They'd chosen the restaurant, got the table. Uh, they were paying as well. Um, so so they, they're sitting there knowing their stuff, quite, you know, happy with their lot. And myself, someone else, not so sure. You know, Pizza Express is just fine. And, and so... Menus come around, and I'm sitting there looking at things, well, I know the central tenets, I know the main points of this. I know chicken, I know lamb, I know beef. Um, I don't know peng sai cabbage. I'm not too sure about this, not too sure about that. So you ask, right? So the waiter comes along, and I asked him what peng sai cabbage did, what it looked like, what it tasted like. And then he said, well, if you're going to go with that, you're going to go with the chicken, I wouldn't have the fish, I wouldn't have this. And he started sort of guiding me through the menu, sort of giving me this really... Interesting. Like, the guy had an opinion. Like, he'd obviously eaten this stuff. And if he hadn't, he was really good at lying. Because he, <laughs> he, he basically made me add on a couple of, you know, more expensive dishes. I was, I was full in austerity measure ordering. I was like, what's the lowest price? I don't, I'm not allergic to anything. I'll just have the cheapest. Uh, anyway, so, you know, peng sai cabbage. There's no, there's no stigma in asking for help in a restaurant. You go in, you don't know what something is, you ask. Someone is there to tell you. That is their job. Um, the restaurateur, interestingly spelt with no N, uh, the restaurateur has, they know this. They know that no one's really going to speak to the chef. So they have these really passionate, well-taught, well-trained, well-brought-up, very presentable waiters and waitresses who are their face. They're the people, sh you know, spreading the message and really crafting this experience. And as you're sitting there, they're the ones... If you have a bad experience, it's unlikely that it's the chicken. It's more likely that the waiter was rubbish or he was rude or, or whatever. But I think the exciting thing with this as a, as a role model is that this is not a chef, most likely, that's waiting on you. This is someone who, as part of their job, has been taught the menu. They've been taught part of the culture of their job is to infuse and live the environment in which that food is being served and to fly the flag for the chef, for the owner of the restaurant. It's, you know, it's, I'm going to make up a word, which, which I think is becoming the, the sharp stick of the day. Um, it's a, it's a gastro-meritocracy. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not dumbed down. It's unashamedly excellent. You know, if you want to have a world-class restaurant, you have a world-class restaurant. You have to be a great chef, but you have to have the lot. You've got to have good door handles. You know, you've got to have someone who's good at the door. It's a whole thing. And it's the man whose name or the person whose name is above the door that's ultimately responsible. And you know, there's an identity there. So, restaurant's done. Let's go to a concert hall. I was at a concert the other day. I wasn't playing, but I was there. And it was a string quartet. I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> anyway, so in a nice new shiny London venue, go in, I'd pre book the tickets. Walk in, and now picture yourselves going into a concert hall, if you will, if you've all been to a concert hall. You walk in, pre-booked tickets, so I went to the box office, gave over my name, asked for the tickets. Out they come and say, well, what's on the programme? And said, so, oh, it's in the, it's in the programme, 250. Fine, buy a programme. Get a programme and so, so where's the concert? So, oh, it's downstairs, you have to go downstairs. So you go downstairs, fine, you're into this kind of holding pen, this little area of, of, of average kind of entertainment. And uh, you know, there's a bar and stuff. Um, and then someone's walking around saying, oh, yeah, there's a programme change. I'm thinking, well, I've just bought a programme for 250 It's probably right, so I'm going to ignore you. <laughs> I'm going to just sit there with my beer and just be happy. So get funnelled in. The lights are kind of playing around. And, you know, you can hear them warming up backstage, whatever. And you sit down. The lights go down. They saddle on. And they play the concert, and it's brilliant. It is world-class playing, absolutely phenomenal. Um, but then at the interval, 
Someone comes on and says, oh, ladies and gentlemen, program change. I'm thinking, again, another program change? How's this? So, oh, well, we're, doing, we're not doing this piece, we're going to do this, and we're going to replace this one with that one. And they're not playing, he is. OK, I'm lost, I'm a bit confused. And, you know, and I, I know these pieces. Like, I, I get really confused with these things. And um, walk out at the end, and I'm not entirely sure what I've just sat through. You know, was it the thing that I had bought? Was it, you know, it's a real mixed message, and it was kind of... Everything was a bit of an effort. Um, would it be too difficult to teach the ticket sellers the, the series, the season? Say, well, you're here for Britain. You might like Finzi. Finzi's in two weeks' time. Or say, well, tonight we're playing Brahms. Do you like Brahms? Like, do you know Brahms? Would you like to know something more about Brahms? It's the whole Pengsai cabbage thing, you know. Um, <laughs> Maybe you don't know or particularly care for Harrison Birtwistle, but maybe someone there could know. They don't actually have to be a composer. Most of them, interestingly, are music students, and they know bugger all. <laughs> or sorry, they let on bugger all. You know, and, and you're sort of you're paying. We ask a lot from audiences. Like you ask them to pay money, pay attention. Is it too much to ask for them to actually do something? I can find H17. Like I'm quite good at counting and I'm quite good at the alphabet. That's straightforward. Tell me something about, you know, the personality of the venue. That's what I want to see. You know, I want Britain to be shouting from the rooftops that, that we can have a, a musical Jamie Oliver or Heston Blumenthal. Like, that shouldn't be difficult. You know, that should exist, and it's not going to be some rebel or rogue from inside the industry making duck larange, serving it as a smoothie. You know, it's not like, it's not going to be someone making beautiful food and serving it on a plate, on a plastic plate. You know, it's going to be someone with a a real passion for owning that experience. Like, I care about how people hear my music, where they hear it, and why they listen to it. Um, and I, it does amaze me that, that there isn't really a facility for this to, to come through. In keeping with the food analogy, there's always a demand for Burger King. You know, there's always going to be this thing. Um, but I'm gradually getting scared that we're trying to make the music industry into Pizza Express. I do like Pizza Express but it's the acceptable professional minimum. It's designed to have personality, uh, but scale, at scale. So it's designed to look great everywhere. And the issue there is, you know, it's acceptable for everyone. It's remarkable to nobody. No one writes home about Pizza Express. You do write home about Marcus Waring. Yes, you paid an arm and a leg for it, but that guy knows what he's doing. You know, the Romana pizza at Pizza Express is a kind of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we are going to sell, you are going to sell more off the peg. You're going to have a lot of quick sales, you know, if you do the kind of quick, easy packaging. But what I think we should be looking for is the deeper relationship, you know, the thing that grows. You identify with someone. And the restaurant continues to add value because they continue to add, they continue to value the experience of the restaurant. And I think we see that with foodie types, people who eat food. Everyone eats food, but some people are really picky, and they don't just eat one thing. You know, what we keep looking for in the arts is this kind of cross-sectoral thing where, you know, you go and see an opera, you see a ballet, you see a cello, you see whatever, man dancing with a kitten or something. You know, but we don't really get that. You get people who do classical music. You get Coldplay and you get, you know, Akram Khan's audience and you get Sadler's Wells. You just get these little segments. Whereas foodie people do actually spread themselves around. They go to lots of things. And there's this inbuilt curiosity that, that I'm completely obsessed with. Um, so the next steps, my mind, I want, a bes I want a kind of, bes I've written a bespoke music laboratory. Because that sounds cool, doesn't it? <laughs> like having a bespoke music laboratory would be awesome. You know, instead of a tasting menu, it's, it's a work in progress or a seat in the studio. Instead of a la carte, it's a recital. But more importantly, it's that we need a view as artists. I think we need a view on the world, not a position in the market. If we can sell the, the why. We can sell the why, it's fascinating. Uh, selling what's merely kind of interesting, it's got novelty value. You know, we, we're in this age of austerity, but perhaps, it, sorry, I read that out of order. I, I flipped this one around. <laughs> maybe it's an age of austerity. Um, but instead of focusing on audience development, maybe this is the time to be focusing on performer development and presenter development not blaming our audiences, but actually giving them something more exciting to listen to. And if we can learn anything from Heston Blumenthal or Fergus Henderson of St. John fame, it's that there is an aspirational desire for the remarkable. There is an audience that wants this stuff. And it's not maybe going to be going to a concert every week. Who goes to a concert every week? 
Anyone? I don't. Oh, you do? Wow. I can't get booked once a week. Like, you know, it amazes me that this exists. But, I mean, that's amazing. Wow. I'm going to talk to you at the end. But, you know, maybe it's not catering for everyone once a week. Maybe it's in making that one remarkable thing. And just to close, I, I would like to see us uh, removing the link between excellence and exclusion. The two aren't the same. You can have world-class quality, and it's not excluding anyone. That's not the thing that we should be focusing on. We should be upping the quality, upping the, ex you know, the excellence, uh, not dumbing it down and, uh, and serving you know, duck l'orange as a smoothie. Thank you. I'm going to play some cello now very quickly. <laughs> We, had to, um, we thought this might have somehow been making those weird cookie noises, which you'll understand in a second. Um, but it does mean I just have to fiddle with it for one second. Is that coming through? So I perform a lot with a lot of technology, and the last big thing I did was with 40 speakers and sort of laser towers and silly things like that. Um, one of my dreams is to be able to remove all the technology from the front end, so it's all baked into the back end. As soon as people see toys and tools and tricks and things, they stop listening and they start thinking about how you're doing it, and they always get it wrong. It's quite impressive. Like, people have this stuff on their laptops, and they always get it wrong. Um, so... The key, the key, I think, moving forward is just hiding it and not telling people what you're doing and how you're doing it. So. Mm -hmm. 